Think of that song that we just sang, and you say, what did Jesus do with all of this power? What did he do with the power that allowed him to create the universe and then to bring salvation to us? Jesus took all that power and served us. How amazing. Let's bow together in prayer. Heavenly Father, this is that part of the service where we expect to hear a word from your word. I pray that this morning, each of us in very individual ways, humble ourselves before the truth of your authority, your word. I may have prepared this sermon, Father, but I recognize that any strength and power and truth in it only is effective because of your truth, power, and authority. Therefore, that all of us would be affected and would be touched and would gain the mind of Christ by the truth of your word is my prayer, including myself. We ask, Father, that we look for ways to put into practice what your word declares today. In Jesus' name I ask, amen. He was known as one of the great violinists of the 1700s. His name was Paganini. He willed his Ganeri violin which was kind of like at that time a Stradivarius, to Genoa, Italy Museum on the condition that they could have it after he died if they promised that no one else would play that violin ever. They agreed, and of course he died. So after death, they took his incredible violin and they put it under a glass box. But left unused, this violin began to decay, and over time Paganini's Violin, instead of becoming this mellow-toned instrument, became a warped, useless work of art, quietly deteriorating there under glass, the victim of disuse. Think of that, a finely crafted wood instrument, and you may know this, but what wood instruments like violins and cellos, if they're handled carefully, they can be played for many, many years, and in fact, they don't seem to show much wear, but as soon as you stop using them, They, like Paganini's violin, turn into nothing but useless works of art. Here it is, shelved. The music for which it was provided and shaped to serve no longer happening. Now you see where I'm going with this as I start a series entitled Shaped to Serve. The same is true of us who declare ourselves to be believers in Jesus Christ, who have been transformed by his power. But I have been transformed by Jesus Christ, not just to anticipate an eternity in heaven someday, I've been transformed to be of some practical good and use here on this earth. And not just once or twice, but continually, that my life fulfills my creator's purpose. I can think of many historical and even local contemporary examples of believers. In fact, Some of them are even in this church building right now who continue to use their shape that's been transformed by God far into retirement to continue to serve God with their lives, bringing glory to Him. But when any of us either withdraw or resist fully serving God, we quietly, like Paganini's old violin, begin to deteriorate. There is nothing sadder than Christians under glass. Today we are beginning a new series I'm entitling Shape to Serve. How do you feel about this new series? Anxious? Oh, right. I can't wait for Pastor Bray to tell me how to serve more people. Or is it making you just a little nervous? Oh, man, I came today. I thought he'd preach on something better. It all depends on your mental picture of what it means to serve. If my mental picture of a servant is some pathetic creature who's bowed down in drudgery, working with a crushed spirit, kind of like a human mule, I'm not going to look forward to this sermon series. But that's not what it meant for either the Apostle Paul or for Jesus to talk about serving God. Throughout the series, we're going to learn the truth and the practical joy of God's major objective for each one of us as believers, which is to become cheerful, willing servants. And in fact, for a believer to reject this primary command of servanthood will turn me into that joyless, pathetic creature who has no fun and shows no joy having been transformed by Jesus Christ. I don't want to live my life like that, and I don't think you do either. But we see a lot of examples of that. So the question is, 
As we begin this series, what should be my, as a believer, my primary motivation for wanting to do something that my natural human spirit doesn't want to do? By nature, I don't want to serve. By nature, I want to be served. I want people to make my life easier. If I could just get all hundreds of you to make my life easier, why, my life would be easier. Not really. What's my primary motivation? I want to be like Jesus, the one who saved my soul, dwells within me. I'm going to open up this passage to you. I've preached on it a couple of times before, but it seems like a great place to start a series on serving God. Here's what Jesus says at the end of the passage we're going to look at today. Jesus looks his disciples in the eye and says this, whoever of you 12 disciples would be great among you must be your servant. Whichever of you would be first must be your slave, even as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. How is that for clarity? And it's so simple. Jesus came to serve. Paul said it like this in Romans chapter 8. I don't have the verse up for you, but you know the verse. We always, we always kind of skip what comes before and, 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 and skip what comes after. We all know this verse in Romans 828, we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who've been called according to his purpose. And then this is the reason he gives. He says, for those God foreknew, he also predestined. Uh, There's some big theological words there that God knows all this. What did he predestine us to? He predestined us to be conformed to the likeness of his son, Jesus Christ. So, If I want to be like Jesus, I need to look at what Jesus did. And what did Jesus do? He served. If I want to be like Jesus, I have to serve. There are no questions about that. Let's stand for a closing hymn and go home. But we won't do it that way. I have a few things to tell you. Jesus saved me and shaped me to make me a servant. The Apostle Paul says in Galatians 4, I want to keep doing this until Christ be formed in me. It takes a whole lifetime for Christ to be formed in me. So in this series, I'm going to begin kind of today with with a broad priority. How did Jesus serve? At the very end of the sermon, I'm going to kind of hover like a drone over the top of that passage I began with in the book of Philippians chapter 2, and then we're going to kind of bounce into that next week. But for today, I want to take you to how it is we can best find ways to serve by following Jesus Christ. And I want you to know that we begin with a big circle, and then by the end of the series, we're going to circle down to something very, very, very specific. And in fact, I want you to see this on the screen now. We have put on our website, gracepointlodi.com. If you go up under resources and click on that, right on the first page there, there's something called Assess Me. Maybe you've never done this, but we are offering this to you. All you got to do is click on that. It won't cost you anything, and you can assess your spiritual gifts. We'll talk more about that in the series, but maybe you'd like to know, where are my spiritual gifts? If I've been given a gift to build up the body of Christ, what would it look like? Go ahead and take that. There's also a couple other tests you can take in there for free. It's a great tool, so make sure you go on our website, click on Assess Me. We'll talk about that every single week. But here's the big idea for the sermon today. If I want to be a true servant of God, I must be willing to be conformed or shaped into the likeness of Jesus. Because if I don't follow the example of servanthood, here's where I will default. I will default to selfishness. Those are your choices today. Servanthood, selfishness. None of us are an exception to that, including me. Colonel James Irwin was the eighth of 12 men who walked on the moon. He was part of the Apollo 15 crew. He made that fourth successful moonwalk in 1971. When he came back, he wrote a book. Maybe some of you read the book or you're aware of the book called Destination Moon. He spoke of the thrill of leaving this earth and the rocket and watching the earth get smaller and smaller outside the capsule window. He realized that as he was flying to the moon that he was about to become a very small fraternity of people who would actually walk on the moon. While on his way back after the moonwalk, he thought about the way many would consider him now to be a superstar. And he was about to become an international celebrity, but this experience had somehow changed James Irwin, not just emotionally, but spiritually he changed. 
He said this in his book, as I was returning to earth, I realized that I was a servant of God, not a celebrity of the world. So I am here as God's servant on planet earth to share what I've experienced so that others might know not just about the moon, but about the creator of the moon. The basic motto, I think, that would help all of us as Christ followers is, I'm a servant, not a celebrity. That's not an easy place to arrive. I've noticed that in my life and probably in yours, we only truly arrive at servanthood after a crisis. Doesn't that sound great? Some of you have had a crisis and could actually give testimony to that. Some of you are in the middle of a crisis and some of you haven't yet had one. May God give to us crises that move us into his service. If you're like me, I sometimes think it is so hard to become a servant. I wish I could just go back in time and be one of the 12 disciples. It must have been easy. I mean, they were right in Jesus' presence. They certainly had no trouble being servants. They must have just loved sitting at Jesus' feet, soaking it in. How can I serve? How can I serve? But if you know where I'm going in this passage, you know that that's not the case either. They had a tough time with servanthood. In, in fact, by my count, three times in Scripture, we are given, given a look, a window, into three very awkward arguments among the disciples of Jesus about which one was the greatest. I find it interesting and valuable that God would not allow his gospels to be photoshopped and photoshop those things out. God left those very awkward things in there. Why? Because they were like we are. We need those very transparent looks at even people who were in Jesus' presence and had trouble with servanthood. So here's the background. For background, instead of me telling you the background, I'm going to read you the background. So I'm going to make the background, the passage before the passage I'm going to preach to you. Here we are. Here's the background. Matthew 20, beginning at verse 17. Now remember, I'm not preaching now. I'm just showing the, sharing the background. This is just background. And as Jesus was going up to Jerusalem about a week before he would be crucified, he took the 12 disciples aside, and on the way he said, stop walking, stop visiting with each other. I have something I want to tell you. Without distractions, I need to prepare you for something. Verse, verse 18, see, you men see that we're on our way up to Jerusalem. And the Son of Man, he referred to himself that way 78 times, by the way, so they knew who he was talking about. So the Son of Man will be delivered over the chief priests and scribes when we get to Jerusalem, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. But on the third day, he'll be raised. This is heavy stuff. If you're a disciple and you're hearing this, you're hearing that Jesus is about to go into Jerusalem, he will be arrested and tortured and killed, and then he'll raise again on the third day. So verse 20 happens. Right after that, verse 20, read it right into it, verse 20 says, So then the mother of the sons of Zebedee, James and John, came up to Jesus with her sons, and kneeling before Jesus, she asked him of something. Now, if you didn't know the end of the story, you do not know what would happen here. This is what you would think. You would think this is what this mother is coming to ask Jesus. She's going to say, please, Jesus, be careful. Let my two sons, Jimmy and Johnny, who, who are sons of thunder, let them protect you. What else can we do, Jesus, to keep you from suffering like this? But that's not her request because you have a Bible open. You can see what the next request is. There's an awkward exchange that comes that teaches us something about our true position in God's kingdom, that we are servants, not celebrities. So let me share with you what would Christ-like service be as a description for believers today. Let me give you a couple of things. Number one, Christ-like servants will accept pain over priority. And here's what she said. Jesus said, what do you want in other words, deeply desire. And she said to him, Jesus, say that these two sons of mine, James and John, are to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your kingdom. Do you see the awkwardness of that? It's as if she is saying, you know, Jesus, it is too bad about all that mocking, scourging, death, and crucifying stuff. I'm so sorry about that. But I really want my sons to have a really good place at your kingdom. 
want James and John to be the vice president and secretary of state. Lofty goals. These guys are young. They're probably in their early 20s. They're uneducated for the most part. They're fishermen. Here's a little bit of other inside information that you may want to know. According to the book of Mark, this mother of James and John is named Salome. She's listed as the sister of Mary, the mother of Jesus. So in other words, Jesus would have called her Doda in Hebrew, auntie. This is Auntie Salome. So in other words, James and John were very likely first cousins to Jesus. Do you see why she's coming up to Jesus? We've got some family connectedness here. They were among the first five boys chosen to be part of Jesus' group of disciples. How very political all of us can become when we think it's going to serve us, can't we? They were seeking some personal advantage over the other ten disciples. How very little human nature has changed. James and John were about to underestimate the cost of following Christ and were about to overestimate their own importance. Something we still, all of us in this room, battle with. Notice that the request is, Lord, I want a place for them to work. That isn't what she says, is it? Look at the passage. I want a place for them to sit. That's different than a place to work. Now, that at least would have been a nobler request. James and John were doing some insider trading, using their mom to get in on some early retirement. In an article written by James Berkeley called The 11-Gallon Head, he declares this to be the underlying attitude of our day and time, and see if this isn't true. That our culture today in America is filled with people saying, all I ask of life is a constant and over-exaggerated sense of my own importance. That's all I want. I wonder, do I ever expect an inside track with God? Do you? Underestimating the cost of what it is to be a true disciple? Feeling like if God just saw my true spiritual resume, he'd be nicer to me? I mean, look how long I've served you, Lord. Look how good I've been or, or how much I've already suffered. And look how much better I am than so-and-so. I wouldn't say it out loud, but I'm so much better than so-and-so. Therefore, Lord, you should do this for me. It's a human weakness and a tendency to which we all fall prey. And when the Holy Spirit convicts us of that and lets it rise into our soul and we see it for what it is, we should confess it as the sin of pride. Anytime comfort and pride is my priority, serving isn't. Anytime comfort is my priority, serving isn't. Number two, Christ-like servants should practice concession, not conceit. So Jesus answered, Auntie, you don't know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup I'm to drink? And now James and John start speaking up instead of the mother and says, we're able, yep, we can do it. Considering what you know about Jesus' kingdom on earth and how he was setting up his kingdom with his own suffering and death, do you really think these disciples understood what Jesus was saying? Now notice that Jesus doesn't just turn these disciples down, he doesn't put them down, he doesn't even scold them, but he doesn't pull any punches. Notice what he says. So he says to James and John, you will drink my cup, but to sit at my right hand and at my left hand is not mine to grant. It is for those for whom it has been prepared by the sovereignty of my heavenly Father. Now, we, right reading here, most of us who've read the Bible, we know what Jesus is referring to by using the phrase, the cup, don't we? He used that same language as part of his prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane in Luke chapter 22. If it be possible, let this cup pass from me. And what was the cup he was referring to? The suffering and death he was about to face. So it's suffering. When we give ourselves completely to God, there is one thing for which we can be sure, and that is that we will not necessarily become rich or famous or comfortable, but we can be sure that the world will not be our friend. If Jesus wrote a help wanted ad for his disciples, it would have read like this, help wanted, servants 
willing to give all of their time, all of their ability, and all of their resources to the cause of the master, and the result will be suffering in a hostile workplace, but the pay will be out of this world. Literally, it'll be out of this world. Jesus will say in Matthew 15, 20, remember the word I said to you that a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. You read the news just like I do, don't you? I don't want to overdo this, but I just want to give kind of a little view of some of the news I've seen recently. Students from a Christian school going to Washington, D.C., subjected to unfair, inaccurate reporting about their trip to Washington, D.C., primarily because they were a Christian school. A New York Times reporter just two days ago took to Twitter to search for former students of Christian schools willing to dish dirt on how Christianity had ruined their lives. Gary Bauer recently said this. I think he said this on uh, Friday. He's a conservative Christian writer. And I quote, American Christians have been unbelievably blessed to live free lives expressing our faith freely for the past over 200 years. But those days in America are gone. The world means to purposely shut Christians up and shut them down. I don't say this as your pastor to frighten anyone. I'm not here to do that. I can't even predict the future. But I can tell you what God's word says. We need to encourage ourselves and our children and our grandchildren and great-grandchildren to lean into the greater commitment to, involvement in, and knowledge of the causes and purposes of the truth and grace of Jesus Christ. We have to be intentional about it. Just running away from it is not going to work. We must serve. But even suffering for Christ doesn't guarantee a special privilege. Let me go back to James and John for a moment here. Here's an interesting side note on the whole account. James and John requested through their mother a place of honor, one to sit at the right hand and one to sit at the left hand in God's kingdom. Jesus speaks now about the cup of suffering they will share. All 12 of the disciples minus Judas, of course, will suffer for Jesus Christ. They will be martyred for their faith. James will end up becoming the first of the 12 disciples in the book of Acts. Herod beheads him. He's the first. And his brother John will end up being the very last that we're aware of through church history that was imprisoned, wrote the book of Revelation, was imprisoned on the island of Patmos, suffered terribly for his faith. So let's call the right place of honor, James, and the left place of honor, John. They would serve at places of honor. The first and the last to suffer for Christ. Number three, Christ-like servants should expect participation, not competition. Now, I want to remind you that we're reading from the book of Matthew. Matthew was an actual disciple. He wasn't just a gospel writer. So, Matthew was there. Matthew remembers this. As he writes this down, Matthew says, this isn't just what I heard, this is what I know. I mean, he had been there, he'd seen how brassy James and John were to use their mother. I mean, come on. How low can you get to ask for places of honor? And he says in verse 24, and when the ten heard about it, and Matthew's saying, I was one of the ten, they were indignant with the two brothers. To be indignant, the Greek word indignant is a gong ekteo, from which we get our English word antagonize. We've all felt it, haven't we? I feel it when I go to, it's been a while since I've been there, but you go to Disneyland and somebody pushes in line ahead of me. I feel agangateo. I'm here. The other disciples were ticked off. I'm pretty sure the attitude of the ten wasn't any better than the attitude of the two who wanted first place. They're thinking, by gum, if there's a promotion to be had, I should have as much chance as James and John to have a promotion. Not much has changed in our indignant department in the world, has it? We're still a society of gripers who think we're all entitled to special treatment. Next Sunday is a, um, a sporting event. Oh yeah, Super Bowl Sunday. You know who's going to win? I've got a clue. I don't care. I honestly don't care. Someone once said this about our professional sports teams. 
Imagine having a player on your favorite team who never misses a play, never makes an error, never chokes under pressure, always knows exactly what to do in every situation. Actually, in every professional sports stadium in America, there are thousands of these perfect athletes. They're in great abundance, and they could be had for a relatively small salary. The problem is they aren't willing to leave the stands and come and play. We are full of blustery competitiveness when it comes to getting our own way. Here's Jesus with his 12 disciples only a week before he hangs on the cross, and at this very moment, competitive spirit is threatening to break the unity that Jesus has been working on them with for the last three years. They were losing sight of the importance of serving. What would happen if a believer that you secretly envy or are competitive with, they may not even know you feel that way, but what would happen if they suddenly started serving you in some way? It would go a long way to letting all that air out of that envy you have, wouldn't it? That's why one of the best things a church body can do, and I want to say this up front of this series, is to all of us engage more in serving the kingdom. Everyone get engaged in serving the kingdom of God. Because a church that serves together stays together. Okay, I just made that up, but that's great stuff. And it's true and it's biblical. Number four, Christ-like servants seek a, a place and not a position. Jesus sees the fighting going on, and so it says in verse 25, but Jesus called them to him. Now, I just want to remind you that in verse 17, he already had stopped them and called them aside. Remember? Weren't they already gathered around Jesus? They must have at some point between then and now broke off into little groups sniping with each other. You ever seen that happen? After a meeting of some kind, people gather in little groups. And Jesus said, you know the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them. Their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you, you who are my followers. Whoever would be great among you must be your servant. Whoever would be first among you must be your slave. And at first, when you read that, it almost seems as if Jesus is doing a pranking. He's pranking his disciples with a strange, weird, opposite day. Because that's not the way the world works. We all know, even to this day, the world works like this. That the most powerful people are the ones who get more people serving them. Jesus is declaring that heaven's rejection of the world's way is how the kingdom works. I mean, just imagine, for example, if you woke up tomorrow and found that money was absolutely worthless. Just picture that. Money was worthless and tin cans were priceless. All the rich people would be homeless and all the homeless people would be rich. We live in a world where we know the price of just about everything but the actual value of almost nothing. Jesus is taking the values that we have in this world and turning them on their ear. And he deliberately, in this verse, uses two very shocking words that CEOs don't normally use when they speak to their people at Facebook or at Microsoft. The first word is the word diakono, from which we get our word deacon. It means servant or a table waiter. If you go out for lunch today, that will be a diakono, someone who waits on you. Jesus says, I want you to be a servant. And then he even goes one step further and he uses another, another word called doulos or slave. This is someone who actually serves because it's their position in life. And Jesus uses both those words to describe, this is what I want for you as my disciples. If the disciples want to be leaders in the kingdom of God, they have to become slaves to the Savior. Does that describe me? Does that describe you? Is that the way you lead your family? Is that the way you lead others by serving them? Well, let's move to point number five, and then we'll make an application and go home and practice this. Christ-like servants look to Jesus for their primary motivation. I've already read this verse to you, so I'll just put it in here. Jesus said, even as the Son of Man did not come to 
be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. The best translation of the word ransom is actually the word in exchange for. We often think of it in terms of kidnapping, don't we? You give me this amount of money, I will exchange that amount of money, give this person back to you. In 1193, the English king, King Richard I, also known as Richard the Lionhearted, was returning from leading a crusade in the Holy Lands when he was captured by King Leopold V and imprisoned in Austria. Austria demanded from England a ransom for their king's release, and the price was 150,000 marks. That means nothing to you until I break it into tons. It means three tons of silver, an almost impossible demand. But the people of England so loved their king, King Richard, that they submitted to extra taxation and a few nobles, history tells us, donated their entire fortunes. They became common people for Richard's release. The money was raised, King Richard returned to England, and that's where we get the expression, a king's ransom. Now you can go on Jeopardy, because you know this. Remember, Jesus, we sang about it all morning, Jesus... The sinless son of God, king of kings, what a kingly name it is, what a wonderful name it is, what a beautiful name it is, the name above all names. He became a king's ransom. The king ransom for him meant that he, the king, would pay the price for us. And not just silver and gold, he would use blood, his perfect blood. The Lord of glory came to serve us so we might be transformed into servants of his eternal kingdom to reflect the power of his love and grace for the world. I read this verse to you as we called you to worship, so I told you I'd come to it. We're here. We're getting towards the end. 1 Peter 1.18, for you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver and gold that you were redeemed, ransomed from that empty way of life handed down to you by your ancestors, but... It was with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. So if as a believer I choose not to wholeheartedly serve him as my Lord and serve the causes of this world, then the very heart of the gospel goes missing. Our service to Christ is the living illustration of his sacrifice for our salvation. When I just receive his forgiveness and am transformed by his power, but I don't do anything about it, we are missing a whole half of the gospel. Notice Jesus never did answer the question asked by the mother of James and John about whether they could have places of honor. Because during this entire conversation, Jesus is picturing himself and his place on the cross. James and John and the other ten disciples are picturing a table. Jesus is picturing a cross. After about two days, Jesus is going to give his disciples a practical lab on what it means to serve. Found in John 13, you're probably very familiar with it. Jesus will take off his outer coat. He will wrap a towel around his waist. He'll take a basin of water, and he will kneel down in front of his disciples one at a time and wash their feet and dry them. And I imagine it was stony quiet in that room as Jesus, their rabbi, did this for them. And it says in John chapter 12, after Jesus did that, he stood back up and he took the towel off and he's probably going like this with his hands and he says these words, do you understand, men, what I've just done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, you're right to do so, for so I am. But if I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash on another's feet. Stop arguing about who's the greatest. For I've given you an example that you also should do as I have done. Truly I say to you, a servant is not greater than the master, nor a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. A servant is not just a knower. A servant is a doer. I don't want to just be a knower. I want to be a doer. And then two days after that, Jesus would again complete the servanthood lesson with the ultimate act of service. He would hang on a cross, voluntarily give his life as a ransom for many. Talk about a vivid lesson. The measure of a person is not how many people you have serving you. 
how many people you're willing to serve, even the ones that aren't easy to serve. So let me take this, uh, just hover before I quit over this Philippians passage. I want to hover here so that you know where I'm going to land next week. Philippians 2, 5 to 9. By the way, this is the earliest Christian hymn. We're not given the, the tune. I wish we were given the tune. This is the earliest Christian hymn written in the Bible. Philippians chapter 2. Maybe it was to the tune of, make me a servant, humble and me. It, it should have been a, a tune like that or something. And maybe it rhymes in Greek. But here's the way the hymn goes. Here's the words to the hymn. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who, being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross." Worship team, come on up. Jesus did not just pretend to be a servant. He wasn't just illustrating. Jesus was a servant. We cannot just pretend to be servants. I just want to warn you that as we circle down in here, it's going to become a little more personal. In fact, by the time we end this series, on that Sunday, we're going to have a jobs fair here at the church. All right! places, tables out there where you can get involved and serve. Maybe some of you, it's been a while since you've done something. We want to make that available. Because there is no joy in life serving Christ without serving Christ. Conclusion. What Jesus modeled for us is this. In kingdom, in God's kingdom, service never begins until we set ourselves aside. Here's two little quick things we can do this week. Maybe you have other things you can do, but here's how I see this unpacking for us. How can I set myself aside for serving God like Jesus did? Number one, how about if I intentionally find joy in surrendering something to God each day this week? Because there is no kingdom service without personal cost. Maybe I want to give up something of my time. Maybe something physical. Maybe some sacrifice of emotion I have to give. What am I willing to give up this week to serve? And secondly, in Jesus' name, maybe I should purposely look to serve someone who can't repay me. They can't serve me back. This last song called Overcome is a great song with the depths of that Philippians chapter 2 truth attached to it. It's a great way to sing. I don't know which of you are chosen to be our prayer partners today, but um, if you're one of those and you don't see someone come on up here, make sure you're here. Maybe we want to close this time together while we're singing and you want someone to pray for you. It may not even be about service. It might be about something else. You just want somebody to pray with you. Maybe after the service is over, they'll still be around here. Let's stand together and sing Overcome. Heavenly Father, I pray that this closing song becomes for us a prayer. More than just a closing song so we can walk out of here feeling like we've accomplished something, but rather so we've been motivated by the power and the truth and the authority of your word to become like Jesus, to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, as Paul says, till Christ be formed in me. I pray that for myself and all of us who are here as believers today. And Father, for those who are here and are, and are still feeling the call of your Holy Spirit because they've not... They've resisted you. They've not given in to you. I pray that this would be the day that they would confess you as Lord and Savior, repent of sin, and come into your kingdom. So we give you these closing moments in Jesus' name.